Hi, I'm Brick Road, and let's do a tier list for all the Final Fantasy characters. Literally all of them. Not literally all of them. There are hundreds of Final Fantasy games. But these are all of the playable characters from the main-ish Final Fantasy series. And I'm going to rank all of them. And I've given this some thought. Like, I have to approach this somewhat logically, or else the whole thing is just going to fall apart and not make any sense. Because really... These games, over the course of 30 years, if you try to compare the power level of a character in one game to the power level of a character in another game, it just almost never works. Just, for example, take any of the characters from Final Fantasy V who can swing their weapon eight times and get thousands of damage per hit. That's pretty good, but it's a drop in a bucket compared to what characters can do in Final Fantasy XIII who are throwing out millions of points of damage over a few seconds and all of that doesn't even make sense compared to say the strongest possible attacks in Final Fantasy 1 which are a paltry 2000 damage or so but still enough to kill any monster in that game in one hit so we have to try to like bring all of this back to some central focus so it makes sense here's what this tier list is going to rank it's going to rank a character's relative usefulness in the context of the game in which they appear. So, this B tier here, right in the middle, B is for baseline. Baseline is just a solid average character for that game. And it's actually really easy because we, with, with some of these characters we can start filling these in right away. Uh, the Onion Knight is the baseline character. Uh, Bartz, and Lena, and Galuf, and Faris, and Kryle from Final Fantasy V. These are all baseline characters. Uh, all three of the Gullwings, so Yuna, and Riku, and Pain from Final Fantasy X-2, as well as Vaughn, Pinello, Balthier, Fran... Uh, Ash, Bosch, Sarah, and Noel. It's easy to put all of these characters in the B tier, in the baseline, because in the context of their game, the characters are all functionally identical. The Onion Knight is here because in Final Fantasy III, you get four Onion Knights, and they all have access to all of the same jobs. Same thing with the cast of Final Fantasy V. All five characters have equal access to the same jobs. If you really wanted to get pedantic, you could value, say, Faris's extra two points of agility or whatever over Bartz's extra point of strength that he gets. And when it comes to, like, the Gull Wings, like, yeah, a couple of their dress spheres do have different ability sets, but for the most part, in the context of Final Fantasy III, V, X-2, XII, and XIII-2, the characters are functionally identical. They're all average. They're all equally strong, and they all equally suck. And that's kind of how we're going to approach this whole endeavor. I'm going to kind of pick a baseline character from each game, and then try to judge the rest of the cast of that game as being better or worse than that character. Does that make sense? No? Excellent. Let's keep going. In fact, we can start this process right now in the B tier, because in Final Fantasy II, Firion and Maria and Guy are all just the baseline character. They're all functionally identical, right? Uh, they all start with access to the same weapons. They all have the same level up system. They can all get the same magic. There's really no difference between them and how you build them up. But Final Fantasy II does have other characters. It has a rotating guest slot that your fourth character comes in and... Well, in theory, all of those characters have the same access to all the same abilities and spells, weapons, and weapon levels that the three main characters do. In practice, there is a very important resource in Final Fantasy II that makes the characters very different, and that is the time it takes you to build them up. The first guest character you get is Minwoo, and I think if you have these three characters as the baseline. I think it's very easy to say Minwoo is an S-rank character. If Minwoo 
stayed in the party for the entire game and had all of the same level up opportunities as all the characters, it would bring them down a little bit because they'd all kind of be equal. But Minwoo's only in your party for a small portion of the game. And for that portion of the game, he is far and away stronger than the other three characters, easily a full tier ahead of them. And we can use this same judgment for some of these other characters. Uh, for example, in the scenes where Joseph is in the party, and in the scenes where Rickard is in the party, I think they're pretty much on par with the power level of your three main characters at that point in the game. Uh, Joseph is only with you for like one or two dungeons very early in the game, and then Ricard joins you for quite a lot of the end game, actually. He's with you from like the late mid game through pretty much everything up to just before the last dungeon, I believe. Uh, so these two characters, they're about the same power level as Furion, Maria, and Guy. Unfortunately, not all characters are created equal. You do have Gordon in Final Fantasy II, and I, Gordon is just an F tier. He's just terrible. His levels are awful when he joins you, and there's really no reason to level him up. And uh, you know what? Layla's not that much better. You have Layla for a couple of dungeons in the mid-game, and you could take her out and train her up in weapons and magic and stuff, or you can just kind of drag her dead weight through the dungeons because she's not going to be with you that long anyway, and your three other characters at that point are going to be so powerful, they don't really need her help. Uh, and this also, I would say, applies to Leon, who I'm going to put in the seat here. He's the character you have for the very final dungeon and the final boss of Final Fantasy II, but whenever I play Final Fantasy II, I get to that point in the game, and Fury and Maria and Guy are so absurdly powerful that by that point that Leon is like, I could catch him up, or I could just like give him a decent sword and let him sit in the back of the party doing what he do. So, we have a couple of games that we put entirely in the baseline, but you see kind of how I'm going to spread these characters out a little bit by using Final Fantasy II as the metric. We have some baseline characters, we have a couple of guest characters who are about as powerful, we have a couple of characters who are not as powerful in a very convenient tiered structure, and then we have one character who for the moment when he's in the party, literally carries the party. Does this all make sense? Okay, excellent. Uh, so starting with Final Fantasy 1. Picking a baseline character from Final Fantasy 1, who is the average character? I don't think this is a difficult question. It's got to be the Red Mage. The Red Mage, right in the middle of the pack, uh, decent equipment set, has access to a bunch of magic, doesn't really have great stats to back it up. Uh, it really depends on what version of Final Fantasy 1 you're playing. For the purposes of this tier list, rather than try to rate all of the characters for every version of every game, I'm going to try to skew towards just the original version. So like the Famicom version of Final Fantasy 1. Uh, so the Red Mage doesn't have a stat disadvantage compared to the other mages. He gets the same spells as the Black and White Mage does for the most part. Decent equipment set, uh, but right in the middle of the pack. So who's worse than the Red Mage in Final Fantasy 1? I? I would say that the Black Mage is slightly worse than the Red Mage. Um, Black Mage does have an advantage in that it gets a few key spells a few levels earlier than Red Mage, like gets access to Lightning 2 and Fast, which are both excellent spells for the early game. Black Mage gets them a couple levels earlier, but Red Mage gets them and can wear decent armor and can hold a sword. Uh, in the first game, in the original version, the Black Mage does not actually get scaling from intelligence. The intelligence stat doesn't do anything that I'm aware of. So the advantage is clearly on the Red Mage there. And then the tier below Black Mage would be the White Mage. And that's just because the White Magic set is not as useful as the Black Magic set in Final Fantasy 1. It's really rare that you have a situation where you have to heal during a battle. The only one that I can think of recently was in the Pixel Remaster, where Chaos, at the end of the game, has all of his advantages from Dawn of Souls, but none of the drawbacks of, like, I have access to the Dawn of Souls equipment. I didn't. Chaos had 10,000 hit points. I needed to heal in the fight. But in the original version, 
The White Mage has a lot of cool advantages and is a cool class to play with, but it really only shines if it's in a team with only other White Mages. Uh, that leaves the Martial classes in Final Fantasy 1. I. I do not think there's a question that the Fighter, aka the Knights, is an S-tier class. It gets all the best equipment. It's basically unkillable. It can use all the best weapons in the game. Uh, the solo fighter is an easier run than some full teams in Final Fantasy 1. That's not that much of an exaggeration. Uh, just below the fighter, I would merit the black belt, uh, aka the monk. The black belt uh, has better damage output than the fighter at really high levels, but is squishier throughout the game because he can't wear the same kind of heavy armor. Uh, the Black Belt also has a stage in the early game where he's very weak. And it's not that long. Like, by the time you're starting to fight Fiends, the Black Belt is really coming into his own and starting to get a lot of critical hits. But through most of the mid-game uh, and up to really high experience levels, your Black Belt's not going to be out-damaging your fighter very much, but might die more often until you get, like, Pro Ring and Ribbon equipped. And that leaves the Thief from Final Fantasy 1. There is no question in my mind that the Thief is the worst class in the game. That's It's not even really an argument. The Thief has nothing going forward, it can't use magic, it has terrible equipment set, no stats at all, but the Thief promotes into the Ninja. Now the other five classes in the game, when they promote, they're basically just a somewhat better version of the job they already were, except for the Black Belt. I think the Black Belt stays exactly, mathematically the same. Uh, there's some difference in stat growth rates over level ups that's really kind of marginal stuff that's not really worth discussing. But the Thief undergoes a transformation and becomes a ninja, gets access to the second best equipment set in the game, just behind the fighter. He can use all the good weapons and armor, and he gets access to up to level 4 black magic. It just so happens that level 4 has the only black magic spell worth casting in the entire second half of Final Fantasy 1, which is the fast spell. So, the question then becomes is, does the drawback of the thief early in the game make up for how powerful it gets late in the game? And I think the answer to that question is yes, unless you're playing a solo run or some other weird challenge run, any four-person party with a thief in it can carry the thief through the early game pretty effortlessly, and then once that thief becomes a ninja, he really starts contributing a great deal to the party. I think it's fair to say that in a regular run of Final Fantasy 1, if you're not doing a challenge run, it's okay to just ignore the Thief's drawbacks because the ninja is so good. And I'm going to say that that averages out to about an A-tier character. And that's Final Fantasy 1. Placed. I think Fighter is definitely S-tier. The ninja and the black belt right behind. And then three mages down below that. Uh, at this point, I do want to point out that this has no bearing on which of these characters are my favorite, or which ones are most fun to use. I often say that my favorite party in Final Fantasy 1 is four black mages, and I stand by that. It's a really, really fun run. Four white mages is also a really, really fun run. Uh, but if we're saying the red mage is the baseline, I have to say the black and white mages are slightly worse, and I have to say that all the martial classes are slightly better, with an edge towards the fighter who is unquestionably the best. So moving on to Final Fantasy IV. Like, who is the baseline character of Final Fantasy IV? That's a hard question, because Final Fantasy IV doesn't give you a collection of characters that you're allowed to use at any time. You can't really measure the characters against each other in the early, mid, and late game. Whatever stage of the game you're at, you have whatever party you have for that point in the game. So we could really only evaluate a character's usefulness for their duration in the stay of the party, except for the five characters in the final party that you use to fight the last boss. One of which is Kane. And I think Kane is a pretty average character in Final Fantasy IV overall. Kind of a boring character. He's got good stats, he's got good equipment, he's gonna put some damage out there, his damage isn't gonna spin the world around. Uh, 
I think it's really fair to say that at every point in the game where Kane is in your party, he's about as good as anybody else in your party. That's fair to say. Uh, this does put a weird situation with Cecil, though. So Cecil is on the list down here twice. We have two of him because functionally he's two different characters. He's a Dark Knight early in the game and then he transforms into a Paladin. Is the Dark Knight good? Objectively, no. Objectively, Dark Knight is the worst class in the game, and it's not even close. We know this because they're like if you use uh, like ROM hacking tools or a Game Genie, or if you play the randomizer, Free Enterprise, getting the Dark Knight in your party and measuring him against other characters in situations that would not arise in Final Fantasy IV you can easily tell that the Dark Knight just sucks, sucks, sucks. Uh, basically, the Dark Knight has no equipment whatsoever past the first couple hours of the game. Once Cecil promotes to Paladin, he there's no more use for Dark Knight equipment. So the best Dark Knight sword in the game is worse than about 90% of the equipment that's available in the game. But we can't really measure Dark Knight Cecil against the entirety of the game. You've got to just measure him against the point where he's in the party. And I, it, he carries the party during that section of the game. Uh, I really think in the time in the game where you're allowed to use the Dark Knight, he's an A-tier character. Easily. Uh, there, there are boss fights that literally cannot do more than one or two damage to Cecil. Um, goes through the Octomammoth fight, the Antlion fight, the Mom Bomb fight. Probably won't ever need to be healed. The only point where the Dark Knight drops off even a little bit is on Mount Ordeals. And there's like strong story reasons for that. Uh, the Dark Knight's traveling up the mountain with his dark sword that can't damage undead. At the top of the mountain he promotes into Paladin. And then the Paladin just wrecks shop the whole climb down the mountain. Uh, it's a really good character moment and... Even at that stage in the game, though, where it's Cecil and then a bunch of squishy mages on the back line, like, he's an invaluable character. He needs to be there to soak up damage, to fight monsters that aren't undead, to help the mages conserve MP. And then in every scene before that, where he's traveling with Rydia and Tella and Edward and the rest of them, uh, he just outshines everybody, pretty much. So, although this does physically actually hurt me to do, I have to put Cecil, the Dark Knight, in A tier for those reasons. Uh, that being said, I don't think anybody will begrudge me putting Cecil the Paladin in S tier. Immediately upon promotion, Cecil becomes the best character in the game and he never ever looks back. He out damages everybody uh, for the entire rest of the game except for mages that can hit elemental weaknesses. Uh, he has some light healing ability which is okay in emergencies, you're never really going to rely on it, but it is there. Uh, the best equipment set in the game, by the time he's decked out with all of his crystal equipment in the end of the game, he's going to have 4,000 hit points, he's going to be hitting for 4 digit damage every single turn effortlessly, and nothing's going to kill him. So Cecil's an S tier character, I don't think there's any uh, real discussion to be had there, and this is a trend we're going to be seeing in future Final Fantasy games as well. They do tend to really lean into making the main character the best character, as we'll see. Uh, so I guess we'll put the rest of the final party. We've got Cecil and Kane placed. Um, the other martial character in the final party is Edge, and I think Edge is a solid A-tier character. His damage output lags behind Cecil's, but he can peek above Cecil by throwing certain pieces of equipment, shurikens and powerful swords that Cecil has already thrown away and whatnot. Edge's real drawback is he's a little squishy. It's hard to keep him alive sometimes on the front line, but he doesn't really have... He has some back row equipment, some back row weapons, but if he's using back row weapons, you're really sacrificing a lot of his damage output. Uh, the other final party characters would be your Black Mage, Rydia and your white mage Rosa, and both of these characters are A tier simply because you really need them to win the game. You need Rydia's damage output from her spells, and more than most other Final Fantasy games, you really need the sustained healing 
that Rosa can provide. It wasn't by an accident or a mistake that they gave you an epic level black mage and white mage to finish up Final Fantasy IV with. So then you got all the rest of these dregs. <laughs> Just all these dopes that don't stay with you for the final party, uh, the final dungeon, the final boss. In some versions of Final Fantasy IV, uh, you can assign these characters to your final party. Once you get to the very end of the game, you unlock some end game equipment for them. Uh, the, most of them, they're all viable at that point. Um, but we're, we're not really going to be judging them by that. We're going to be judging them by their role in the game at the point where they are. So I think the next two characters that we really should place are the Red Mage characters, Tella and Fusaya, and they both fill the same kind of role in the party. Uh, but watch what happens. They're, so the idea with these two characters, they're both red mages. They both have white and black magic set. They both have a detriment of magic points. They don't have enough magic points to really cast spells for the entire length of the dungeon. You're going to have to uh, fill them up at some point or use a tent or something. And both of them have kind of middling stats. Neither of them are as good as the dedicated white and black mages in the game. But watch what happens. When Tella is in the party, he's a B-tier character. Because for most of the time Tella is in your party, he's your only access to white and black magic. You can't heal unless it's Tella's turn. You can't hit anything with fire damage unless it's Tella's turn. He's all you've got through some of those uh, mid-game dungeons. Fusaya who mathematically is superior to Tella in every way and has a better spread of spells and has more, like twice as much magic. Tella has 90 magic points and Fusia has 190, I think. But when Fusia is in the party, he's in a party with Rydia and Rosa. And he really doesn't have a lot to do. And he ends up being a C-tier character as a result. Final Fantasy five or IV has five-person parties. And it really, in that kind of environment, it really penalizes a character to be a generalist. When you have five people that you're addressing and giving commands to, it really behooves each of them to specialize in something great. So in the final party, you've got Cecil for sustained uh, attack damage. You've got Edge for uh, decent attack damage and like high peaks. You've got Kane for tank ability and decent damage as well. You've got Rydia for black spells. You've got Rosa for white spells. What's Fusaya for in this environment? Really, you just use him to kind of spot heal. Uh, the other mage characters in Final Fantasy IV are Palum and Porum, and you only have them for a short amount of time, but it's interesting because you can contrast them with Tella, whose stats are way worse than both. So you have almost the same kind of situation at the end of that party uh, through the dungeons and boss fights where you have Palum and Porum and Tella because you've got a dedicated white mage, you've got a dedicated black mage, and then you've got this guy who kind of is trying to do both. In this environment, though, Palum is an A-tier character and Porum is a B-tier character. Uh, and the reason for that is through those dungeons, black magic is very important. And Palum is just better at it than Tella is. Uh, you really need fire damage on Mount Ordeal. You really want ice and lightning damage through the waterway. And then in the Cagnazzo fight, uh, throwing out good lightning or throwing out good ice spells to do a lot of damage and using lightning spells to break his water shield, all of those are really important. The benefit Tella has for part of that journey is that he has access to really high tier black magic that Palum hasn't learned yet. But that's less useful than you might think, because he can only cast, like, two of those spells before he's tapped. Porum, on the other hand, is a white mage. She's just going to be healing, and Tella is already in the party basically doing that. Uh, so, for a lot of the dungeon, you're using Palum to deal damage, and then Tella and Porum to kind of spot heal as needed. And then in the boss fight against Cagnazzo, typically you'll have one of the black mages breaking the water shield, one of the black mages dealing damage with ice magic, and then... Porum healing. So Porum's a little less useful than Palum overall. If you're in a situation where you're playing like Free Enterprise, the randomizer, or if you're playing a version of the game where you can assign the characters uh, 
to the party, I think this disparity grows even more. It becomes even more clear that Palum is the better black mage, whereas Porum is not as good of a white mage as Rosa is. In the base game, these questions never come up, but in some of the randomizers, they might. So that leaves the other martial characters from the game. Uh, Yang and Sid. Uh, you know, I really feel like Yang is an A-tier character, and Sid is a B-tier character. Sid is actually much worse than B-tier in like an objective sense. If you're looking at the characters as a whole, for example, playing a randomizer, you never want to see Sid. He's slow, he has lousy equipment, uh, he's just not that good. But in the game, you only have him for a couple dungeons in the mid-game, and most of that time is a four-person party, along with Cecil, Tella, and Yang. So you really are relying on Sid for quite a lot of your damage, and he does a good job. He does a good job in that environment. Also, Sid has an added benefit in that in the Magnetic Cave, which is the first major dungeon he has to go through, you're not allowed to use metallic equipment. Well, all of Cecil's good equipment is metallic. He is totally neutered in that cave. Whereas Sid gets a wooden hammer that does pretty good in that cave. He's okay. Uh, Yang, however, outshines Sid at every turn. Uh, and he's just really powerful. He gets more hit points. He doesn't have to worry about the magnetism at all. Uh, Yang also has extra commands with his, uh, his like, what are they called? Build up and brace or whatever. I never use these commands, but you can if you want. Uh, just, but Yang, you're going to see a lot of damage very consistently. Uh, he's basically the edge of the party before you meet edge, if that makes sense. And that just leaves Edward. And man, you know what, buddy? I'm sorry, Edward, but you're just Gordon version 2.0. <laughs> That's too bad, because Bard was S-tier in Final Fantasy V, and now it's F-tier in Final Fantasy IV. Oh well. Here's the thing. You, really, you only have Edward for a very small slice of the game, very early on. Like, by the time Cecil promotes to Paladin, which is early in the game, you never have Edward at all after that point. But the point where he's in the game, when he's in your active party, it really doesn't matter. He has a hide command that you can use to just make him exit the battle. And you might as well do that in every single random encounter and every single boss fight he's in. And you will barely notice because Cecil is the Dark Knight. He's carrying the party. You've got Rydia for healing. Eventually you get Rosa and uh, Yang for the big boss fight. And then Ed Edward's gone. And that's it. His role in the story is fulfilled. Uh, if you're playing a randomizer or a version of the game where you can assign him to your endgame party, Edward improves dramatically because he gets some really excellent endgame equipment. I always love seeing Edward in my free enterprise runs when I play the randomizer. But this tier list is not for free enterprise. So unfortunately, Eddie... All right, moving on to Final Fantasy VI. This is the game with the largest cast of characters. Uh, I think the best baseline character in Final Fantasy VI would be Celeste. Celeste is the baseline character because there's an equipment set shared by several characters in the game that I think you could argue is like just a really good equipment set. Heavy armor, swords, all the good stuff. Uh, Celeste shares his equipment set with Terra, Locke, and Edgar, but all three of those characters have advantages that Celeste doesn't. Uh, the only piece of unique gear Celeste can equip that I know of is the Minerva Bustier, and it's not unique to her, it's unique to her and Terra. It's a really powerful piece of armor, it's her best piece of armor, but really there's nothing else to recommend using her outside of just a really solid equipment set, which in Final Fantasy VI is enough to make a good endgame character. Keep in mind, too, that unlike most of the games in the series, the final dungeon in Final Fantasy VI makes you assign 12 characters to active parties. You've got to use almost every character. If you recruit every single character in the game and you don't kill Shadow on the floating continent, you're only leaving two characters behind. So characters in Final Fantasy VI can really get away with being worse on average than characters in, say, Final Fantasy IX, where you can often just 
pick which characters you like best and use them for the whole back half of the game and leave everybody else on the bench. In 6, you can't bench anybody, and you really wouldn't want to bench Celeste especially. Uh, but it gives us a good comparison with the three characters that are just better than her. Uh, the first of which is Edgar. I'm going to put Edgar in the A tier. He has the same equipment selection as Celeste, but he has the tools command, which is just excellent single target and AoE target damage for pretty much the entire first half of the game. Uh, he also gets access to spears in his equipment set, which makes him a really good dragoon. If you combine the dragoon boots and the dragon horn, Edgar can get a lot of work done, uh, whereas Celeste would have to do a lot of leveling up by learning magic and getting stat ups from espers, which really any character can do. So Edgar has a slight edge there. I'm also going to give Locke a slight edge because he can equip the Valiant Knife and the Valiant Knife is just ridiculously strong. There, I don't know what the formula is. There's some kind of correlation between his hit point level and the amount of damage the Valiant Knife does. But to me, it always seems like when you equip the Valiant Knife, Locke just goes crazy. Also, Locke has a benefit in that without Locke, you cannot get some of the endgame equipment. You can't get the Ragnarok Sword, the Ragnarok Esper, whichever one you want to take, which means you can't learn the Ultima spell, or you can't get the Illumina or Lightbringer Sword. You can't get the Paladin Shield. All that stuff you need Locke for. Uh... And along that same line, you have to recruit Locke in order to get the Phoenix Magicite, which has really powerful healing magic. Kiraga, Arise, and Re-Raise. Very, very important spells. Uh, anybody can use those spells. They're not localized just to Locke, but they are tied up in Locke's recruitment. And then you need him to bust open some doors in Narsh to get some of that really good endgame equipment. All that stuff is kind of academic. I think the Valiant Knife alone puts him in the A tier above Celeste. Uh, and that leaves Terra. Terra has the same equipment set as Celeste, but she is markedly better. And I don't think anybody is going to begrudge me putting her in the S tier. Terra has a command that you push a button and she's just twice as good now. She does twice as much damage with attacks, with spells. She heals for twice as much. Uh... She can't do this constantly because it's a function of how many ability points she earns in battle. Uh, but if you're using Terra a lot, you can pretty much get away with a turn or two at least in any boss fight you bring her to. And that's going to be good enough. Uh, having a character that you can just double whenever you want is fantastic. And because she has the same excellent equipment that Celeste has and because... She also has access to the Minerva Bustier, which is a very powerful piece of armor. Uh, I think Terra is definitely S tier in Final Fantasy VI. Let's get the other S tiers out of the way, because this game has several of them. Sabin, definitely S tier. The Blitz Command is just ridiculously good from the moment he joins the party all the way until the end of the game. Every character in Final Fantasy VI has a special command, and most of them are like somewhat useful at least some of the time some of them fall off like edgar starts the game using tools a lot by the time you get to like the mid game uh, you're going to be attacking or jumping or casting spells with them a lot more sabin always wants to do blitz on every turn forever that's how good that command is i'm also going to definitely put setzer up here in the s tier if only for the fixed dice uh, the fixed dice are a weapon that only setzer can equip it's a purely mathematical attack. It's only a function of his experience level. He does not need stats. He does not need other equipment. He does not need magic. He does not need espers. He does not need his special commands. The dice are good enough forever once you get them. Uh, even at very low level, it's relatively easy to throw thousands of points of damage with the dice. Uh, they're that good. The character that I think I would have the hardest time placing... Hmm... I'm really struggling on where I should put Mog. Here's the deal. Mog is basically... Once you get to the end game, he's basically like Edgar. He gets spears, he can jump, which is really good damage. Uh, Mog's 
dance command is not as useful as tools, but there are some situations in which dance is very good, actually. Uh, I feel like it got nerfed quite a bit in the Pixel Remaster. I couldn't swear to that, but Mog is essentially a Geomancer, and Geomancy got a big buff in just power level between Final Fantasy V and VI. However, Mog gets a benefit, that, or two benefits, really, that uh, really, really set him apart. First, he can equip the Snow Muffler which is one of the most powerful pieces of equipment in the game. It makes it makes him unkillable. If you get a snow muffler, you can equip it to Mog, give him a spear, have him jump, and he's going to be an excellent member of your party. He also is the only character that can equip the Molulu's Charm, which completely removes random encounters. So... I almost want to move Mog up to S tier just for the Molulu's Charm. Because there are some areas of the game that can be just miserable if you're slogging through the random encounters. But if you assign Mog to the team, he's just going to drag you through it and you're going to have a good time with it. I think that might be appropriate. Because he basically has the same advantages in equipment as Edgar does, but he's got that Malulu's charm on top of it. Uh, and at that stage in the game, I don't think Dance versus Tools is that much of a conversation to be had. I don't think you're going to use either dance or tools at that point in the game. Uh, who is left down here? I definitely think that Realm is an A-tier character. She has really high magic power. If you give her a bunch of magic spells, she's going to do better with just casting magic than anybody else in the game except for Terra. Uh, Realm actually, I think, has a higher natural magic stat than Terra, but she doesn't have the ability to just double all of her damage output. Uh, she has bad commands, and her equipment set is basically limited to mage stuff, but you really want to equip mage stuff on her anyway. The other A tier character I definitely think is Gao. Uh, rage is very difficult for a lot of people to wrap their head around, but if you understand which rage is to get, and how they work and how to use them, you can get him the Stray Cat and Templar rages on your first visit to the Velt, and he's basically will carry any team through the entire world of balance. Uh, a lot of times when I play the game, I don't even take him for a second visit to the Velt. I don't ever take him back to learn anything else. I just use that Stray Cat Rage at any point in the game where he is, and I level up his strength at every available opportunity. That's going to be really consistent damage that's going to keep pace with anything that the main four characters are going to be putting out with their equipment until very, very late. Uh... Gao doesn't fall off until you get to that, like, Ragnarok and Lightbringer tier of equipment. And at that point in the game, I think, you, you, if you really wanted to, you could take him back to the Velt and have him learn some really great endgame stuff. Uh, that kind of leaves us with the dregs of Final Fantasy VI. I think if Celeste is a B-tier character, you definitely have to call Shadow a B-tier character. He has a slightly weaker equipment set than Celeste, but he has a better command. Uh, his throw command is going to be putting out damage that's going to beat anything Celeste can do without just broken relic abuse or power leveling. Uh, Shadow doesn't really excel at anything, but he does have a use like a unique evasion property where his dog will counterattack for him. Uh, no other character can do that. It's a pretty cool thing to happen. That leaves these four jabronis. I think if Celeste and Shadow are B tier, you gotta put Yumero in the C tier. Yumero has decent damage output, but he's now he's not really gonna crack 2,000 uh, that often. One of the benefits of Yumero is he starts with a Snow Muffler. He can't take it off uh, to give to another character, but he has it inherently, which is really good. And there's a couple good relics you can give him. A Gauntlet works really well for him. Uh, to increase his damage output. He's going to be pretty consistent damage when you put him in the party, but he's not going to outshine Shadow or Celeste doing basically the same work. And then that leaves the bottom three. I think it's appropriate to call Cyan a C-tier character. He's definitely better than Yumero in a lot of ways. The problem with Cyan is, compared to other characters, his equipment set is bad. 
You gotta get him really, really deep into the world of Ruin before you start finding samurai swords that are really worth equipping. Before you get stuff like the Zansetsuken or the Murakamo, uh, he's really limited to just whatever he had at the very end of the World of Balance. His technique is Bushido, which has some good attacks, but he has to sit there and charge these attacks up. Like, you just watch his meter slowly build up. Uh, for example, Tempest is his level 4 Bushido move, has the same length as his standard ATB bar. So his ATB fills up, you get his turn, you select Bushido, you watch the same bar fill up again to level 4, then you select the command and he can do some damage. Um, the level 1 Bushido doesn't have any charge up, is back row okay, and ignores defense. Those are all great properties, and it basically replaces his attack command. Uh, but he's not going to be able to hit the same level of damage output as even Celeste or Shadow will. And it's too bad, because he's got a great mustache. Uh, that leaves Strago and Gogo. I think Strago is a D-tier character in Final Fantasy VI. Uh, Strago is the blue mage. Blue magic in Final Fantasy VI is not terrific. There are a couple good blue magic spells, but they're not better than the black magic spells that anybody can use. If you're going to have a caster in your party, you might as well have Realm or Terra casting spells they've learned from Modwin, rather than Strago casting spells he learned from some rando on the belt at some point. And that leaves Gogo the Mimic. Gogo the Mimic has pretty much the same equipment set as Realm and Strago. He's limited to the magic gear, but he can't use Espers, which means he can't gain stats. And... He can be assigned any skills you want, but in Final Fantasy VI, most skills are bad, except for Blitz. And maybe Tools, but mostly Blitz. Uh, the one skill that you would like to give him, Terra's Trance, he's not allowed to use, which is too bad. So he's really just a worse version of Sabin, and he's worse by a lot. Like when Sabin is hitting 6,000 damage with his best Blitz, Gogo might be hitting 3,000 or so. That's not anything to sneeze at, but it's also not much to recommend the character. I would really rather, instead of having a second Blitz character, I would rather his slot be filled up with somebody who's gaining levels and gaining stats from Espers. I'm gonna put Gogo in the D tier. Sorry, not sorry. No, that's not appropriate. C tier. Blitz is that good. Blitz is good enough to drag a D tier character up to C tier. Uh, but I would not put Gogo in a party over Cyan or Yumero. Uh, Gogo and Strago, they're the ones who bench my airship when I go into the final dungeon. Okay, we have about half the series placed. <laughs> we got through the game that has the biggest cast. Going on to Final Fantasy VII. Which character in Final Fantasy VII is like the baseline character? Well, more to the point, what differentiates characters in Final Fantasy VII? Because Final Fantasy VII and VIII and uh, X... I don't know why it took me that long to think of the word X. I guess I've just been awake too long. Uh, the characters are very homogenous, but there are some differences between them. In Final Fantasy VII, the differences come down to their limit breaks and their weapon sets. Uh, most limit breaks are pretty pedestrian. There are a couple of outstanding ones. But I think if you're looking like who's the most average character in this game, I, I think you could really make the case for Barrett. Uh, Barrett has a, a decent variety of, of equipment, both front row and back row equipment. I don't think he has any standout limit breaks. I think his very final limit break, I don't even know what it's called. What is it called? Barrett's Big Score? That's what I would call it. Uh, I think it's pretty good, but I don't think it's better than the best three limit breaks in the game. Uh, I don't really know a lot about how characters have different stat sets in Final Fantasy VII. I believe that they do, but I don't know where Barrett would sit in that pack. What I do know is that when he's in my party, he's just a solid character doing solid things, and eventually I replace him with better characters. And you know what? I feel pretty much the same way about Tifa. 
Uh, Tifa is a character that the first few times I played the game, I tricked myself into thinking she's a lot better than she actually is because of the way her limit break is structured. Whereas Barrett fills up his limit bar and then he does his like big powwow attack and whatever he does, Tifa starts rolling slots. If she knows five limit breaks, she can perform all five in a row. The problem is no individual limit break of hers is very strong. And unless you hit all of them, the damage output is not going to be comparable to what other characters can do without having to go through the frustration of rolling slots. Uh, so yeah, she's a solid character with decent damage output. Uh, her weapon set is entirely front line, and I don't think she has the strength score comparable to, uh, say, Cloud, who would be the best front line character. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead right now and put Cloud up in the S tier. Uh, <laughs> Cloud is the best character in the game, by far. It's not really even a discussion. He gets Omni Slash, and Omni Slash is better than everything else in the game. It's better than the second best thing in the game by very, very wide margin. Uh, on the other kind of average character in Final Fantasy VII, I would say would be Red Thirteen. I think I value Red Thirteen slightly higher than these other two characters because he gets Lunatic High, which can haste characters at a point in the game where you don't have access to other forms of haste. Other than that, I don't think any of his limit breaks are really stand out in my memory. I don't mind assigning him to the party, but I think I would assign him to the party over Barrett or Tifa. All right, what about the dead girl here? Like, what do we do with Eris? So, Eris is strange because she gets killed, spoiler alert, uh, about halfway through the game story. At the end of disc one of a three-disc game, of which disc three is just the final boss, really, uh, she dies and you can't use her beyond that point. That means she really never gets to see the overpowered materia combinations or the, like, the tier three and four spells. Uh, she does have an excellent limit break, arguably the best limit break in the game that makes your party invincible, but you can't use it past a certain point in the story. On top of that, I don't think she has a very good equipment set. I don't think her staves are very good weapons at all. Uh, her damage output is noticeably lower than Cloud's and Barrett's and Tifa's. Uh, that's noticeable early in the game because you spend so much time in Midgar with just those four characters. In fact, the Final Fantasy VII Remake is just that part of the game with those four characters. Uh, we're not judging her on the merits of the remake, though. We're just judging her on the merits of her being a Disc 1 character in Final Fantasy VII. And I honestly would not put her in my party at any point. I don't... Like, you really have to put in a lot of time and effort to get her limit break leveled up to the point where she can use it uh, and make yourself invincible. But there's no boss fights where that is really a benefit. None of the boss fights on disc one really merit that much work. So from that standpoint, I'm going to put Aerith in the C tier. I think she's behind Barrett. I'd rather have Barrett in the party or Tifa chaining all her limits together than having Eris casting a heal spell with her limit or whatever it is she does. She's not the worst character in the game. This this hurts to say, man, but you gotta put Kay at Sith in the F tier. He's just... <laughs> I wish he wasn't bad, and I've used him in my active party probably more than any other character in the game. But his limit breaks are awful. There are uh, sequences in the game where your character's limit fills up and it replaces their attack command. And usually you're like, oh man, my limit's filled up. I can't wait to do my super attack. But with Kaet Sith, it's always like, oh man, my limit's filled up. Well, I guess I'll summon the toy soldiers again. Just not good. <sighs> I wish that wasn't the case. So I think he his, his best weapon has, like... Scales based on his hit points, similar to how Clouds works. I think that's accurate. Can you tell that I really don't know Final Fantasy VII as well as some of the previous games? Uh, you'll win the game with Kaet Sith in your party. It's fine, but 
there's really no reason to have him in the party over the other available characters. Uh, speaking of your other available characters, I think Yuffie and Vincent and Sid all belong in the A tier. They're better than Barrett and Tifa. They're not... They can't quite reach what Cloud is capable of. Sid, I think, uh, he's a good frontline character. His limits are just solid. They're just, I think they're just better on average than Barrett's or Tifa's. Uh, Vincent, his limit breaks are awful, and I don't like using them. Uh, you can get good damage, but he it, it, he transforms into monsters and he becomes berserked, and I'm always a little wary of having a berserked character that's not a known quantity, if that makes sense. Like, I'm fine with Yumero being berserk, because I know he's just going to hit some nerd with his bone club, and then he's going to throw Cyan's stupid ass at the same nerd. With Vincent... You're going to get, like, elemental attacks, and what really puts Vincent in the A tier is he has a weapon that has maximum accuracy that he can combine with the death blow materia to always get death blows. I didn't know about this combination when I played the game back in high school. I learned it in recent years. Somebody on my stream helped me out with it, and I've never looked back. Vincent has been a solid mainstay in my party ever since. Uh... The benefit of Vincent and Yuffie as well is that all of their weapons are long-ranged, but they're also fairly strong weapons. Yuffie especially, her best weapon is called the Conformer, and it does dam more damage based on how high a level a monster she's attacking. The stronger the monster she attacks, the more damage the Conformer will do. Uh, she also has fairly, just fairly good limit breaks altogether. I think she's the only character other than Eris that has a limit break that heals the party, uh, which is very situational, but it does mean she has access to healing outside of the magic and item commands, which is unique to Yuffie. I think that's fair. Uh, I think my favorite party to use is Cloud and then uh, Yuffie and then either Vincent or Sid. Unless I just, I just have to put, he's just awesome. Kids, it's just awesome. I wish I could, he's not, though. He can't be. I'm sorry. <laughs> we do have kind of a bardic musical theme going on down here in the F tier, don't we? Like, Gordon is supposed to be a bard, too, isn't he? Anyway. Baseline character from Final Fantasy VIII. Well, first we have to ask the same question. The characters in Final Fantasy VIII are very homogenous. What sets them apart? And the answer is the same thing in 7, it's their limit breaks. Each of the six characters has a different limit break, and some of them are excellent and some of them are not. The only character in the game that has another difference that I'm aware of is Squall. Squall has a maximum accuracy on all of his attacks all of the time, because he has a special function where if you push the button at the right time, he gets a guaranteed critical hit. That alone makes Squall an S-tier character, even before you factor in his limit break. Uh, Renzo Kuken is just an, a, a huge number of physical hits, and limit breaks in Final Fantasy VIII are brokenly powerful because if you know how this system works and you know how to set it up, they're basically just things you can pick off the menu. You don't have to wait for a bar to fill up, you don't really have to be in a great amount of danger, you can just use them whenever you want, as often as you want. And Squalls is one of the best of the limit breaks. So the other five characters at a baseline, limit breaks aside, are functionally identical. They can all equip GFs, they can all learn magic, they can all use the same items, they can all get the same commands equipped. I think the most baseline character in Final Fantasy VIII is going to be Kistis. Uh, because her limit break is blue magic, and blue magic is just a decent grab bag of effects she's got some damaging stuff she's got some like weird esoteric stuff like the level five death or whatever that kind of thing uh, she has a couple just really really good ones uh, in final fantasy 8 though having access to that sort of limit break like yeah she can use her acid bubbles or her flamethrower or whatever or she can just cast blizzara which she has 99 of in stock and basically get the same effect. Uh, there are some standout blue magics, like Degenerator is really good. 
but compared to the other characters' limit breaks, I think she's middle of the road. Unfortunately, the bottom of the road has to be Selfie, and she's not even... Like, compared to Blue Magic, Selfie's magic set drops her in D tier. There are no C tier characters in Final Fantasy VIII. Selfie really is a full tier behind Kestis, uh, because her limit break lets her cast regular magic spells a couple times in a row. And it's a slot attack. So you have to roll the slots until you see the spells that you want at the number of times you want to cast it. It's frustrating to use. It's overcomplicated in terms of like what spells will appear on each list. You can sit here rolling over and over and over and never see anything better than Thundara. Uh, you definitely do want to have Selfie in the party at certain times. The final dungeon in Final Fantasy VIII, you are splitting into two parties. You really don't have to use both of them a lot, but uh, she, you still will break the game because the game is so broken. You can have Selfie in the party and have her be super effective. She's definitely not an F-tier character, but I think all of the other characters in the game, when their limits pop up, I'm like, yes, I will use their limit. And with Selfie, I'm like, you know what? I'm good. Uh, that leaves Renoa. Renoa is an A-tier character because of her limits. She's the only character in the game with two limit breaks. One of them is uh, Combine, where she combines with her dog Angelo to do various effects. The other one is Angel Wing, which basically puts her in a berserked magic state. There's a lot of setup with Angel Wing. You can set it up so the only magic she has stocked and junctioned are really powerful spells like Ultima, Flare, Meltdown, etc., and then trigger Angel Wing and just watch her chain cast those spells. The problem with that is that Zell and Irvine, their limit breaks are just so much better without the setup. Uh, Zell's limit break is almost as good as Squall's, where you're putting in button combinations to do karate attacks, and you can chain karate move A directly into karate move B, back into karate move A, for as long as you can keep it together. And if you've got Squall's strength at some outrageous number, he's going to be doing damage comparable to Squall's Renzo Kuken. Same thing with Irvine. When it's Irvine's turn, uh, he gets his limit break. You just hammer the button and he shoots and he shoots and he shoots. And if his strength score is really high, he's going to put out an insane amount of damage. I am going to pull Irvine back to A tier, I think, because it uses up ammunition. And the best ammunition for his best attacks is relatively difficult to come by. You have, it only refines from pretty rare equipment. He can get really good damage with just his baseline ammo, but he's not getting Squall or Zell uh, level damage with it. I think Final Fantasy VIII does have a strong case that Squall, Zell, and Renoa are the best party, whereas in other Final Fantasy games, I don't think you can really say there is a best party in... Eight, I definitely do think that, because Renoa has a combined ability called Invincible Moon, which does the same thing as Eris's level 4 limit break that she doesn't get to use in any of the hard boss fights, except Renoa does get to use it. There is RNG elements, Invincible Moon doesn't always come out. You can usually come count on it to come out if you, if you really need it to win a fight, you can probably rely on it within one or two resets. But Invincible Moon will buy you enough time to spam Renzo Kuken and duel on Squall and Zell's turn, and then 2 million damage later you've beaten any boss fight in the game that you care to have fought. Final Fantasy IX. Who is the baseline character of Final Fantasy IX? I've given this a lot of thought. I've really, really thought quite hard about it and i almost think there's not one i almost think there is no just b tier character characters in final fantasy 9 are either really good or they're below average uh but i think i am going to continue the trend from eight and put the blue mage solidly in the b tier here's what's weird about final fantasy 9 is it's a four character party the previous two games had three character parties but Final Fantasy IX, the battles and the boss fights especially, they still kind of feel like they were balanced for three characters. And then the fourth character, uh, is, it can really just be an auxiliary character. Uh, 
you almost have the opposite situation from 4, where in 4, characters were penalized for being generalists because you have 5 people being a specialist was really the way to go. In 9, I almost, like, being a specialist is almost detrimental. And Quinna is an excellent generalist. Uh, Quinna's weapons have a very high variance in damage, which means uh, he or she is going to put out average damage on average sometimes her, uh his or her fork's gonna hit for low amounts sometimes the forks are gonna hit for high amounts and then the blue the blue magic set has healing in it it has status ailment uh healing in it it has a couple of elemental attacks it has some weird esoteric stuff it has one of the three guaranteed quad nine attacks in the game uh if you really love catching frogs, you can get 9999 out of frog drop every time. Uh, Quinna has a setup. Oh, yeah, Limit Globe. Hmm, yeah. That's also a guaranteed 9999 if you can cast it while he or she is at one health. Oh, I gotta put Quinna in A just for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd forgotten. But yeah, Quinna, the blue magic set is really strong in 9. And I, Quinna is an excellent just fourth character. You have three characters in the party whose job is to put out as much damage as possible, and then Quinna's job is to support them. Uh, the character most similar to Quinna, I'm going to say is Freya, but I'm definitely not going to put Freya underneath Quinna. Uh, so she has better damage output, more reliable damage output with her spears and with her jump command, and then she has her dragon magic, which isn't as varied as Quinna's blue magic, but it has some good effects in it. Uh, she has a regen, a full party regen spell she can cast. And she has a, the second of three guaranteed quad nine damages. If you fight a lot of dragons, her dragon crest move is guaranteed to do 9,999 damage every time you cast it. Uh, so, okay, the, the blue magic is good. The dragon magic is good. What magic isn't good in Final Fantasy IX? And you know what? I am going to have a B-tier character in IX. After all, it's going to be Vivi. I want to put Vivi in the B-tier. Black magic is good, but... <sighs> I don't know. I feel like in a game where the martial damage is so, so top-notch for so long, Vivi's elemental damage... It can spike above it, and if there, he's hitting a weakness, it's definitely better. But just for clearing random encounters and getting through boss fights, I, I would rather have a martial character with just a really good weapon, I think. Uh, Vivi also has a really major flaw in that his best magic spells, his, element, his uh, third tier elemental attacks, Faraga, Blizzaga, Thundaga are attached to a weapon that can be missed. I've never missed this weapon. It's called the Octagon Rod. I'm pretty sure I've gotten it every single time I played Final Fantasy IX, but I've met people who have missed the Octagon Rod, and if you miss it, you can never go back to get it, and then Vivi just can never learn those spells. He can still get, like, Doomsday and Flare, but then his skill set is really all or nothing. It's like, okay, I've got Flare, which I can cast four or five times before I'm tapped, uh, and I can't hit elemental weaknesses anymore. I think that really weakens Vivi as a character. It's a really, it really is a shame if you have a character that if you miss one of their weapons, they're just bad forever. Eh, ba not bad. They're worse forever. Uh... But below Vivi, I think we put both of the White Mages from Final Fantasy IX. I do not understand why these two characters are so similar. They're both White Magic users. They're both Summoners. There is some difference between Garnet and Aiko's White Magic and Summon sets. Uh, I know Aiko gets the Jewel spell and the Might spell, and Garnet gets... I don't know. Uh, but then their Summons are completely separate. Uh, Aiko gets Phoenix and Medine and Fenrir, while Garnet gets the more standard kind of Rama, Shiva, Ifrit, Bahamut set. Summons are worse than Black Magic. I don't have time to sit here and watch a three-hour movie every time I want to deal as much damage with Ifrit that, as Vivi can do with Fyra. 
And I really feel that white, the white magic set in particular is very devalued in Final Fantasy IX because the game has so many auto abilities. Through most of the mid game, including the whole part of the mid game where Garnet and Aiko are both hard coded into your party, you have to use both of them for a couple of dungeons. You'll get auto potion. You can equip auto potion on all of your characters, and it's more than good enough to heal your party through any of the random encounters or any of the boss fights at that stage in the game. I'm really having difficulty thinking of a point in Final Fantasy IX where I really needed to cast Kiraga or Arise or something like that when Quina can cast White Wind or just use a Phoenix Down. Uh, or Freya can cast uh, Raises Wind and put Regen on everybody. The White Magic set has buffs like Protect and Shell and Haste, but again, these are things you can equip with auto abilities eventually. And the battle system, the timing in Final Fantasy IX is so strange because you can cast the Protect spell and then it will literally run out before every actor on the field has had a chance to do anything. It like if, There's no point to ever casting Haste because you'll only be hasted for about 10 seconds. I've seen the haste spell get casted, and then the haste effect wear off before the hasted character got to take a turn. It gets that ridiculous sometimes. It's better to just equip auto haste, at which point you don't need the white mages anymore. All right, so that leaves the other three martial characters in Final Fantasy IX. I definitely think you put Amaranth in the A tier, for sure. Uh, he can throw, he's got some good chakra stuff. He's got return damage as an auto ability, which uh, you can do some shenanigans with. He's never going to be quite as good as like the two big attackers who I have yet to place with his regular attack command, but he gets some utility out of throw and chakra that I... Chakra? Is it called chakra? Yeah, no, it's called flare. Is it? I can't remember now. No, Chakra is one of the moves in his Flare list. I think that's right. And then when he trances, it's called Elon. That sounds right, right? I've used Amaranth before. <laughs> He's in the game. Uh, that leaves Zidane and Steiner. I'm going to play Steiner next. And Steiner's really weird. I definitely think he's A-tier. Just because of the strength of his regular attack command. He's the strongest character in the game. His attack command alone, he doesn't need other commands, which is good because other commands kind of suck. Uh, so he's got his sword arts, which I can't even think of one that's a standout to me. Uh, he does get the only ability in the game that can hit a target more than once. If he uses his charge command, every character who's low on health will make a regular weapon attack. So if your party, if you've got Zidane and Amaranth in the party and they're low on health and Steiner uses that attack, you can get up to three hits of however much damage those characters can do, which can be considerable, but I don't think it's worth keeping your party at low health. Steiner's other command is Sword Magic, which is basically the same thing as the Mystic Knight from Final Fantasy V. He gets an elemental buff from a black magic spell that is now attached to his sword, no, it doesn't work like the Mystic Knight, does it? It's a standalone ability. He uses it once, and then he does one attack with like a fire sword or an ice sword or something. The downside to that is he can't do it himself. It requires Vivi to be in the party. And Vivi is fine, but if you really want to make use of that ability on Steiner, you've got to commit to having Vivi in the party as well. Now, Vivi's taking up a spot that I really think is better used with someone with more utility like Quina or Freya. So Steiner is definitely good enough to have in the party just because of his attack command. Uh, that leaves Zidane. And I've really also got to put Zidane in the A tier. I don't think Final Fantasy IX has an S tier character. Uh, Zidane is not as strong as Steiner, uh, but he has the uh, he has the final command that will do quad nines if you power it up. His thievery skill will always do nine 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 if he's stolen enough stuff over the course of the game. That's just an excellent command through and through. 
The tricky part about placing Zidane and Steiner is their placement in the party throughout the game is very different. Zidane is always in your party, forever. The only time you can ever remove Zidane from the team is, weirdly enough, the very final boss. You can take Zidane out of the party if you want to. So you get to watch him just grow in power over the course of the entire game. And there are uh, upgrade points where he will really surprise you. Like, oh, I didn't know Zidane could do that much damage. My goodness. Whereas Steiner, you have him early on, and then you don't have him at all through the mid game. And you don't really get to start playing with him or really start to learn things with him until disc three, like a fair amount into disc three. You're really on the blue Narciss of disc three uh, sailing around on the ship before you can really start to see Steiner come into his own. That's really late in the game. And that's beyond the point where you've had Quinna and Freya and Amaranth and the, all of the caster characters in the party. In some ways, Steiner is the last character you get, which may be why they balanced him so he lives and dies based on his attack command. Either way, I think they're both A-tier characters. I don't think Final Fantasy IX has an S-tier character. The tiers are pretty well compressed in that game. Just stay away from the white mages and you'll be fine. Orin is a good baseline character from Final Fantasy X. And we're back to a game where the characters are very homogenous, like they are in 7 and 8, but they don't start out that way. Throughout the entirety of the main story, each character has a niche they fill in the party, and they're going to have to fill it over the course of the game. You're going to need Orin to hurt certain monsters. In Orin's case, that monster is the armored monster. His weapons ignore enemy defense. So he's very strong. Uh, his limit breaks are good through parts of the story, but they start falling off a lot late in the game. Uh, so Orin's a good baseline character. And I, let's, let's start with who's worse than Orin, and this is easy, and it's Kimari. Kimari's an F-tier character. I, he's a blue mage in a game where blue magic is just really, really bad. I don't know of a single blue magic spell that's really worth using in Final Fantasy X, and there are some ways you can manipulate your overdrive meter to fill up as often as you want, but you're really not going to want to do that with a character that has lackluster abilities. Uh, there are two different versions of Final Fantasy X. In one version, each character has a hard-coded niche, except for Kimari. Kimari is, tries to kind of be a generalist, again, in a game that really... Uh, benefits specialist characters. The other version of Final Fantasy X on the expert sphere grid, you can kind of do whatever you want with any character from the get-go. You can kind of take them any direction they want on the sphere grid. But even in that environment, the best use I found for Kimari was being a second character who can steal pretty early in the game. Uh, he does have the same quality as Orin as most of his weapons. I think all of his weapons, actually will ignore enemy defense, but unless you literally take him along Orin's path of the sphere grid, uh, he doesn't have like all the strength nodes to make use of that really well. So just running down the rest of the characters in Final Fantasy X, it's really a matter of how are we filling, what niches are we filling and why. Uh, another really important niche is elemental damage, that is Lulu's forte. I think Lulu is a B-tier character. Uh, elemental damage is very, very important early in the game through a lot of... Pretty much every location you go through has either a blob monster or one of the elemental glyph monsters that you need to cycle Lulu in to kill. But if you don't see one of those monsters, you're not going to cycle Lulu in at all. Uh, blue magic is terrible in 10. Black magic is better, but still not as generally good as just attacking monsters. Then there is Yuna. I think you could make the case that Yuna is an A-tier character, uh, because she's the only character that can summon. No other character can learn that ability. It's unique to Yuna. It's almost... It kind of fills the role of her limit break, because her actual... They're not called limit breaks in this game, they're called overdrives. Her actual overdrives just make her summons better. Uh, it lets her summon a monster 
and the monster she summons has a full overdrive meter. So she doesn't really have an overdrive to herself. Her overdrive is really her summon system, and then she can make it a little bit better if her meter is full. You can win any fight in the game with the proper application of summons. Yuna is there for you. If you're having a random encounter, you just aren't feeling it, but you don't want to run, run away, you can summon any of your summon monsters and get the job done. She's also going to be your primary white magic caster through most of the game, and healing is very important. On the expert grid, you can get away with giving some healing magic to some of the other characters. Like, Kimari is a good example. What else is he doing with his time? Uh, but on the base grid, in the base game, Yuna's going to be your only white mage for a lot of the game. She's going to be your only source of, like, protect and shell. Uh, and the elemental... the This was the first game that had bar spells. No, Final Fantasy 1 had bar spells, but 10 kind of brought them back. So you, they're not called that, though, are they? No, they're called null spells. Null tide, null fire, null ice, etc. Those are very situationally useful. But when they're useful, boy, how do you really do want them? And then Yuna has them for you. And then you're going to be constantly cycling her in for revival and healing and Asuna and all the other good white magic stuff. Uh, that leaves the... The other white magic user in Final Fantasy X is Titus. His white magic is the haste spells, haste and hastega. And Titus is an S-tier character. Uh, haste is really good throughout the mid game, and then when you get to the end game and you're really, really using a lot of your limit breaks a lot of the time, uh, Titus's limit breaks just excellent. When you get his final one, slice and dice does a bunch of hits in a row. It's not as many hits as Waka though. <laughs> Waka is also an S tier character in Final Fantasy X, and uh, it's because his limit break can hit, I think it's 15 times in a row if you get all the slots. And the slots are not as frustrating as Tifa's or Selfie's or k Sith's. They're a lot easier to hit consistently with a little bit of practice. And the damage output is outstanding. I don't think anybody reaches Waka's level of damage output. And then you have, uh, well, Waka's niche, I guess we should talk about too, is throughout the game... Any monster that has a very high evade, like flying monsters, Waka has really good accuracy. So he hits those, monster, those monsters, and he typically one-shots them the whole course of the game. Riku's niche is that she steals, and when you steal from a robot, the robot dies. So that's kind of fun. Uh, also, sometimes there'll be treasure chests on the field uh, that she can steal from. Also, stealing is just excellent in Final Fantasy X all the way through. You almost want to steal in every single random encounter. In the base game, Riku is going to be your only thief for a little while. On the expert grid, uh, like I, I gave Kamari and Lulu the ability to steal pretty early on, just because nobody else... Uh, they weren't really doing anything else on a lot of their turns. However, her limit break is Mix. And Mix is hella busted. So Final Fantasy X has the distinction of having three S-tier characters, which is pretty good. I guess Final Fantasy VI has four S-tier. And it feels weird that Mog is here in this esteemed company, but I talked myself into it. Uh, Mix has some really amazing stuff in it. Uh, if you watch any video of people killing, like, the big bad super bosses in Final Fantasy X, the kind of super bosses where you really need a maxed out sphere grid to even stand a chance, Riku is there mixing. It's the cornerstone of all of those strategies. Uh, in fact, I, usually you'll see just Titus, Waka, and Riku in those teams doing the work, and they don't even bother cycling other characters in. I've never gotten to that level in Final Fantasy X, but I've gotten to the level where I'm starting to max out some of the sphere grid with some of the characters, breaking damage limits, getting to the point where really the only reason to cycle a character into the party is the strength of their limit break, their overdrive. So I've seen firsthand, even at that low level of the broken nonsense this game gets up to, Titus, Waka, and Riku uh, are really all you need. Uh, Final Fantasy XI doesn't count, and Final Fantasy XII we've already placed. There is a slight difference between 
characters in the cast of Final Fantasy XII. I think there are some stat differences, first of all, like like the cast of V also has. But I always recall on the Final Fantasy Reddit, I read this scathing review of Balfir, like... It sucks that Balthier is the worst gun user in the game because his gun animations take 0.4 seconds longer than anyone else, so it's harder for him to chain gun damage, or some ridiculous argument like that. So, technically, Balthier is worse at using guns than Pinello is, but it's <laughs> it's not enough to break the cast of 12 up into different tiers. Which brings us to the cast of 13. This is a really weird game to judge because every character in this game can deal millions and millions of points of damage. So it seems weird that I'm placing Lightning in the B tier along with characters like Kane and Sid and Tella. Ugh. Lightning doesn't deserve to be on the same horizontal row as Tella, but I do think she is probably the most average character in Final Fantasy 13. Uh, so she's a great commando and she's a great ravager, which are your two big damage dealers in 13. Uh, those are the two roles that you're going to be in most putting damage out. And her third role is medic. And she's a passable medic for a lot of the game. But getting on to the end of like chapter 10 or so, uh, maybe even chapter... Is chapter 9 the one that ends with the big Bartandalus fight? I think it is on the airship. Uh... Her medic starts to drop off hard, and through some of the random encounters, she can still be your main healer, but once you, especially once you get down to Grand Pulse and you're starting to take on some of the bigger, badder monsters and some of the big hunts, her medic is no longer going to be up to snuff, and then it's really a matter of, do you need to cycle in somebody who's a better medic than Lightning, or is her damage output still good enough to keep her on the team? Uh, her big super skill is army of one i think it's just a big i think it's a just a big commando hit uh so probably impressive but not as good as the other big super moves that we can see that we'll get to uh just above lightning on the lists i'm gonna go ahead and put your boy saz saz has two uh advantages over lightning he's still a really good commando he's still a really good ravager he's not a healer at all not until you want to go really deep into the crystarium when you start unlocking everybody's roles uh, which is something that you're not going to do in the base game probably at all you've got to go really deep into the post game before you start caring how good of a medic saz is but saz learns the haste spell before anybody else and the power level change in Final Fantasy 13 before you are regularly regularly using haste and after you are regularly using haste is tremendous. When Saz opens starts opening every battle throwing haste out, you will really notice it. He's also an excellent party leader. This is something I didn't notice the first time I played the game, but I had it pointed out to me the second time I was playing through the game and I noticed it immediately and it's Commandos are your physical attackers, right? So the single target commando attack is just called attack, base attack. The AOE commando attack is called blitz. So when lightning wants to blitz, she'll jump into a bunch, middle of a bunch of enemies, and she'll do this link style spin slash and hit all the monsters. Saz uses guns, and the guns have range. So his blitz attack is just this spray and pray that can come out much faster than lightning can spin, and he can do it from across the battlefield. So, positioning in Final Fantasy XIII is very frustrating because you can't actually move your characters. So any way that you can influence their positioning really does make a difference. So throwing lightning into the middle of the mix to Blitz versus letting Saz stay on the sidelines in Blitz really does make a difference in certain cases. I also think it's just easier for Saz to hit more monsters with his Blitz than Lightning can. When you go really deep into the endgame, Saz starts falling off hard, uh, other people learn haste, and I think I've read a, a, an account of how he kind of mathematically 
in an objective sense, is the worst character in the game. But you have to go millions and millions of points into the Crystarium before that starts to be true. For most of the mid and late game, through the like, last boss of the story, and even through some of the really difficult hunts on Grand Pulse, Saz is your bread and butter. He was mine, at least. And I'm going to put Fang up in the A tier as well. Fang is difficult to use because one of her roles is Sentinel. I have played Final Fantasy XIII three times to completion, and I do not understand how the Sentinel works. I have had it explained to me, and I still do not understand it. I cannot make sense of what like the Sentinel auto abilities are supposed to do. The only use that I can seem to get out of the Sentinel role consistently is your team enjoys damage reduction for each Sentinel in your party. So if you switch to a Paradigm deck that has Sentinel, 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 right before an enemy throws a big attack out, you will take considerably less damage. Uh, both because the Sentinel herself gets a big damage reduction, and also because the Sentinel gives a slight damage reduction to the other two members in the team. So three Sentinels together, they're all getting their big reduction for themselves, plus they're getting two slight reductions from the other two Sentinels in the group. All of that is true, and it's the only real use I've found uh, for a Sentinel. The other problem with Fang is that she doesn't have Ravager from the beginning, and Ravager is where a lot of the big damage is. She's an excellent commando, uh, she's got a lot of good commando abilities, and she's an okay saboteur. Uh, I think she gets kind of the... Uh, does she get slow? I think she gets like slow in that sort of saboteur stuff. Uh, but if you're using Fang as your party leader, she can do the high wind attack. And High Wind is the big penny damage. That is a 2 million damage hit when you select the attack. If Fang is leveled up enough, and if she has equipped uh, with a Genji Glove, which breaks the damage limit, she can hit 2 million damage with that attack. And that's more than anybody else can do in the game. Uh, I think it'll even... Whenever you watch videos of people like just destroying like the giant turtle monsters, the, which are the biggest, baddest monsters in 13, it's always showing Fang dropping that high wind attack. Uh, so yeah, I think it's fair to put her in the A tier next to Saz. Who else goes in the A tier? You know who goes in the A tier is Vanille. Uh, Vanille is an excellent saboteur uh, because she's the one, she gets D-Protect and D-Shell, which reduces an enemy's physical and magical defense and that's awesome. She's also a really good medic. She's going to be your main healer for quite a lot of the game. Uh, the way I like to play the game is if Lightning's not cutting it as my medic, I will cycle Vanille into one of the other party slots and have them both be a medic for the battles where it's needed. That would be enough to put Vanille in B tier. What brings her up to the A tier is her super attack is the death spell. Death has like a 3% chance or whatever of hitting any monster in the game. It doesn't matter who the monster is or where you find them. I think maybe Orphan, uh, the very final boss, might be exempt. And maybe Bartandalus as well. But there are some hunts in Final Fantasy XIII that gate off progress or gate off powerful equipment. Like stuff you really want to get your hands on so you can continue to explore Pulse and make your characters stronger. But it's going to be a long time before you're strong enough to complete the hunt. Or you could save, cycle Vanille in as your party leader, and try death. And if it doesn't work, just reset. Uh, I've done that every single time i played 13. I think everybody does. There's a couple of hunts that are just notorious for being death bait. So Vanille has that unique functionality. And I think it's appropriate to put her in the A tier for that reason. Uh... Hope, you know what, I'm going to put Hope in the B tier along with Lightning. He's an excellent Ravager and he's an excellent Medic. Uh, Hope's job is to basically do whatever you need to do in the battle where he is, if that makes sense. He's a character that I will cycle into battle if it's a battle that, alright, I just don't have enough healing for this fight, let's just assign Lightning, Vanille, and Hope together. And everybody can be a Medic and I can instantly heal my whole party back to full. Or, okay, I'm just not 
doing enough damage in this fight. Like, I can stagger the opponent, but I need to tear them up. Hope has got a bunch of great Ravager stuff. Uh, I'll cycle them in for this one fight. But Hope is not a character that I will ever build a party around, which is not the case with the other four characters I've placed so far. That just leaves Snow, and Snow is, an, like, he's got Commando and Ravager and Sentinel, but his main thing is Sentinel, and I've already explained, I don't, I don't even really understand how Sentinel works. I can't get Snow to really do anything useful unless I have him doing damage. Uh, he has way more hit points on his Crystarium than I think the other characters do, but sheer number of hit points is not as powerful in 13 as sustained healing over time, which he can't do. Uh, I have completed all of the content in 13, including the final boss and every hunt in the game and the big turtle monsters, and never once needed snow in the party, so I think I'm being generous putting him in C tier. The reason he's in C and not in D is because there's not really a noticeable power disparity between him and, say, Lightning or Hope. Any of them can be decent commandos, any of them can be decent ravagers. It's just with Hope, throughout the entire early and mid game, the game really wants you to have him be a sentinel, and I'm just like, nah man, I'm good, thanks, <laughs> don't need a sentinel. That brings us to the cast of Final Fantasy XV. I know I've got people from my Discord who are going to be like, where's 14, bro? Y'all should play 14. All of your Final Fantasy XIV characters are S tier. Congratulations. You did all the raids, you got all the equipment, you guys are all the best. Uh, Final Fantasy XV. Who's the baseline character? I'm going to say that it's Gladio. Gladio is big damage, big tanky, and really what differentiates the characters in 15, uh, you're really controlling Noctis 99% of the time. And then you, you know, their characters just have AI scripts that run, and you can influence what they do by giving them equipment or by using your tech bar. Gladio's tech bar is good for big damage. Uh, he's got techs that do big damage to one target. He's got techs that do big damage to sweeping targets. Uh, he also has the best link chains with Noctis. Link chaining is a system by which if uh, one of your allies attacks a monster and then you attack a monster immediately afterwards, you'll get bonus damage. It's actually pretty easy to set those up with Gladio because he's the biggest guy on the field. He's got the biggest weapon. It's really easy to see what he's doing and then work accordingly with him to get those link chains. You can also control Gladio if you have the Windows version of the game or the Royal Edition or whatever it's called. And it kind of turns him, I don't I don't want to say Dark Souls, but a little bit Dark Souls in that it's he's all about uh, like dodge rolling and like filling up a fury meter. Uh, I really don't like playing anybody in the game but Noctis. So really I'm kind of judging Gladio on the strength of him being one of my AI controlled allies. Uh, the next one I'm going to assign is Pronto, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, I played Final Fantasy XV several times to completion. One of them was as close to the hundo as I think I could have reasonably gotten. Like, I killed the Adamantois, and I finished the Pityos Ruins, and I completed every single quest in the game, except for the ones where, like, the dudes are broke down in their cars on the side of the road, like, I just couldn't be arsed. I could not tell you what Prompto does in combat. I just can't. I, 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 I would never spend tech meter on him. I, I, it feels like he always has the lowest hit points. He dies the most often. Uh, yeah, I don't know what he does. <laughs> he, so each of the characters in 15 have like a passive skill. And Prompto's is endearing. He's a photographer. He takes photographs. So every time you stay at the inn, you get to see what pictures he's taken. And you get to like pick out and save your favorites. That's fun. And it's really endearing to the character. And it really helps you build a relationship as a player with the characters in the game. But it doesn't help you in fights. So I don't really know what Prompto's part function in the party is. Uh, I think he's a waste of meter. I would not spend tech on him. Ignis is an S-tier character. 
Uh, I would put Ignis in the A tier because he is more useful than Gladio. I'm always happy to spend bar on Ignis. He's got the ability to uh, exploit elemental weaknesses on enemies, which is very nice. He also has... He's got a couple abilities that I use throughout the game, but the one that really puts him into S tier is he has the regroup tech. And I use this tech more often than any other tech in the game combined. There are areas of the game where I am happy to not use Gladio or Prompto, not ever spend bar on them, because the bar is much better reserved for Ignis and the regroup tech. It heals the entire party, it revives dead party members, and it teleports all four of your characters off to the side of the battlefield so you can regroup. And it buys you a couple of seconds in case you need to use some more items or cure status ailments. If you're in a bad situation and it's very easy in 15 to get overwhelmed and just mobbed by monsters on all sides, you hit the button, Ignis regroups. Everybody, follow me! That would be enough to put Ignis in S tier. But he's also the only character whose passive skill, which is cooking is good mechanically. Uh, you stay at a campsite, it just cooks you food. There's a lot of food that gives you really good passive buffs. Like for the next day, you'll have increased hit points or increased critical hit chance. Uh, some of them are very rare and require you to really go hunting for supplies. But if you're really, really having trouble with a boss, you can almost always find some food that Ignis can make for you to give you the buff you need to get through. I absolutely think Ignis is an S tier character. He's definitely a full tier above Gladio, and Gladio is definitely a full tier above Prompto. Honestly, if you just played the whole game with Noctis and Ignis and Gladio and Prompto wasn't there at all, I don't think I would have ever noticed his absence. And that just leaves him, leaves us with Prince Noctis. Noctis is the only character out of 99 who I am placing in the double S tier. Noctis is the most powerful character in this series, and it's not close. All of the characters in Final Fantasy XV, all of your the, the bro characters with you, they can all use magic, but it's made very clear in the lore that all of the magic they enjoy is derived from Noctis. This doesn't manifest mechanically, and I'm not going to penalize, like, oh, Ignis can only use potions because Noctis imbues them with his magic princely juice. That was a gross phrase, and I'm not going to say that again. Uh, I'm not going to penalize Ignis for, like, if he wants to cast a fire spell, he can only do it because there are lore reasons that Noctis allows him to do it. All four of the characters technically have equal access to casting spells, say. But there are a couple scenes in Final Fantasy XV where Noctis is functionally invincible and is just dealing hundreds of thousands of points of damage effortlessly. These are scenes where like, if they were cut scenes, you would not think anything of them. They're like Advent Children cut scenes where he's just flying around and swords are weightless and people don't need to touch the ground. If you saw them in a cut scene, you'd be like, okay, that's ridiculous, whatever, I guess he's Superman. Uh, Final Fantasy 13 has cut scenes like that. But they're not cutscenes, they're battles. So you're seeing the damage pop-ups. You're seeing, holy crap, I'm fighting Leviathan and I'm actually pushing the buttons to make Noctis attack. And he's doing so much more damage in this scene than I've ever seen him do before in any other battle. Uh, it's more damage, sustained damage over the course of that fight in that Leviathan fight and then there's a fight in the end of the game against the final boss that's the same way where the conveyance of the game is, this is how powerful the King of Lucis is. We're showing you not just the fact that he can fly around and throw glowy weapons, but we're also showing you mechanically the numbers that you can compare to what you saw him doing in a dungeon an hour ago and see how much bigger and badder and infinite he is now. It's not the same as Cloud doing Omni Slash or Zell doing a bunch of 9,000 damage duels in a row. It's, <laughs> it's hard to describe if you haven't played the game, but 
Noctis is definitely the only double S tier character in the series, except for Kate Sith. Thank you for watching the incredibly long 99 character tier list video. I've been Brick Road. These are all of the Final Fantasy characters. I think this is correct. Some of this looks weird to me, but I think I didn't make any errors. <laughs> All of these characters are appropriately placed relative to the other characters from the same game. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, we've all wasted our time.